so we're going to start day two, uh, exam review. This is, we're going to start with Walker's. That's the largest day two book. And that's going to be the book that you're going to come back to at any time you can't find something on day two. Look for it in Walker's, Walker's Estimating Guide. Walker's follows the CSI format. And what this means, it's broken down into 16 sections that basically walks you through the development process. So section one is general requirements, section two is site work, section three is concrete, section four masonry, metal, woods, plastic, and then section seven would be thermal and moisture protection, section eight doors and windows, section nine finishes, on down through there. And so it walks you through the entire process of building a building. That's the new approach that, that came out with volume uh, edition 25 a few years back. And that's what most of the books or most of your construction books are going to is this CSI format. You begin with site plans that show the building on the property as well as utilities and sewer connections and storm and water retention. You have architectural drawings that show the layout, the floor plans, and the elevations. We have structural drawings that show structural load bearing systems. You have mechanical drawings that show plumbing, HVAC, and fire protection. You have electrical drawings that show power and lighting. Elements of a set of drawings, you have specifications. These are instructions written by the architect. You have the cover sheet, has essential information required by the estimator and foreman. You have revisions, are necessary for clarification and small modifications. You have change orders. These are the result of revisions which must be in writing and must be signed by all parties. You always want to get your change orders signed by the owner, the person you're doing the work for before you start the work because a lot of times they'll try to talk you out of uh, charging them for those, for those uh, changes. Orthographic projections is a parallel projection to a plane by lines perpendicular to the plane. In this way, all dimensions will be true. This is the most common type of drawing used for working drawings on a construction project. Isometric drawings are drawings in which all horizontal and vertical lines have a true length. Isometrics are commonly used for plumbing, electrical, and HVAC drawings. A uh, title block on drawings. The title block is located on the bottom right-hand corner or the right-hand panel. The title block lists the project title, the architect's seal, his or her registration number, and a signature of the drawings. Calculating centerline dimensions. The formula for calculating centerline is to add four times the thickness of the work to the inside dimensions or subtract four times the thickness of the work when viewed from the top, from the outside dimensions. Common wall dimensions. The wall thickness, four inches. You would multiply four times four equals 16 inches. If the wall thickness is six inches, you have four walls times six inches, 24 inches thick. If you're using eight inch block times the four walls, you have four times eight, 32 inches you're going to add or subtract. Site plan. The main purpose of the site plan is to locate the building within the confines of the building lot. It is important to locate the building within the zoning setback requirements. Setback dimensions are shown in feet and hundreds of feet, not inches. A registered land surveyor performs a site survey. Structural drawings. Structural drawings provide a view of the structural members and how they will support loads and transmit these loads to the ground. The letter S prefixes structural drawings. Mechanical drawings can be plumbing, HVAC, or fire protection. The letter P prefixes plumbing drawings, while H prefixes HVAC systems, and FP prefixes fire protection drawings. The letter E prefixes electrical drawings. Other development issues. In any case, the boundaries of the lot on which the building is to be constructed should be estimated by markers called monuments and set by a registered surveyor. Drainage and utility plans are often required for water retention areas on commercial and residential projects. Site improvement plans including curbing walks, retaining walls, paving, fences, and steps. The invert of a pipe is the bottom of the pipe through which the liquid water or sewage flows. Benchmark or BM. A known elevation on the site 
used as a reference point during construction is called a benchmark or listed as a BM. The benchmark is a point of known elevation established by a registered survey and marked by a brass plate on a post at or near ground level by a brass plug. A builder's level is also called a transit level. A transit is also called a theodolite. That's almost always on the exam. The difference between the rod readings at two locations will be the difference in elevation. A LOS or line of sight is the line of sight from the crosshairs in the builder's level to a point viewed on the target. The station is a point you're working from or a point you're trying to establish or verify. Station elevation, SE, is a point above the reference point, typically the benchmark. The benchmark is a station of known elevation and is expressed in terms of feet above sea level. The back sight, or BS, is the rod measurement obtained by the line of sight. The reading when the rod is held on a given benchmark or station elevation. The height of the instrument, or the HI, is the height of the line of sight above the benchmark elevation. The foresight, or FS, is the rod measurement obtained by the line of sight. The transit level readings. The station elevation formula is benchmark plus BS back sight equals height of the instruments minus your foresight reading. Equals your, that gives you your station elevation. Your foresight reading formula is benchmark plus back sight reading equals height of the instrument minus your station elevation and this gives you your foresight reading. Taking transit level reading. Set up the instrument at a convenient point between the benchmark and an unknown elevation where the rod held on the benchmark will be in sight. Level the instrument. Take a sight on the rod and record the reading. This is called the back sight. This reading added to the benchmark elevation is the height of the instrument. Have the rod move to a convenient location between the instrument and the unknown elevation. Swivel the instrument around so that the reading can be taken on the rod at a new location. This is your foresight reading. Record that reading and subtract it from the height of the instrument. The result is the elevation of the point on which the rod rests, or station one. Now move the instrument to a new position between station one and the unknown elevation and take a backsight reading. Add that backsight reading to the elevation of station one and you have a new height of your instrument. Have the rod move to a new station and take another foresight reading. From it establish the elevation of station two. This procedure is repeated until the final station reaches the unknown elevation. So you go all over the piece of property taking these readings and you, and you determine the height of the land at each one of these uh, sites. Site work. Most site work is shown on civil drawings. The contractor will use the site grading plan to determine the quantities and cut and fill. It is often not possible to tell the exact nature of the soil, so a geographic engineer will be hired to test the soil. There are many methods to determine the content and nature of the soil. The most common is the test pit. The test pit allows for visual inspection of the soil content, stratification, water table height, and cohesiveness of the soil. A common method for larger construction projects is test boring, which provides a sample of the soil at extended depths. At this point, a PERT test is done to determine how quickly water will be absorbed into the ground. The site is then cleared and grubbed. Clearing and grubbing. Clearing refer refers to moving the brush, trees, and topsoil, while grubbing refers to removing the stumps. Topsoil is removed from the structure site and stockpiled on site for reuse in lawn areas. Clearing work is calculated by multiplying the area by the depth that must be maneuvered. The work is calculated in cubic yards and is often bid in unit price per cubic yard. Demolition work typically defines moving any existing structures are parts of structures. Demolition can be very labor intensive. This is the main reason remodeling costs more than comparable new construction. Demolition estimates should include labor, machinery, hauling, and dump site impact fees. Demolition work is often bid in a lump sum due to the variety of tasks that must be performed. Excavation is simply digging a hole for some purpose, such as erecting a building or laying a water or sewer pipe. Bulk excavation 
means moving large amounts of soil around to establish a desired gray. A commonly used method for bulk excavation is the cross-sectional method. The cross-sectional method divides the area into the grid of small equal sized squares, rectangles, and triangles. It is the easiest and most frequently used method of compacting grade cuts and fills when the plot plans show both original and proposed contours. The contractor then tabulates how much cutting and filling will be need to be done to meet grade. The volume of soil moved in each square is tabulated. Then the soil is excavated it tends to swell or increase in volume. Swell is expressed as percentage over the original volume. When earth is compacted, it tends to be compressed and is expressed as a percentage of the original volume. We need to know these calculations. Calculating swell. 27 cubic yards with an 18% swell, you would multiply 118% times your 27 yards, and come up with 31.86 cubic yards. What was the original volume of 27 cubic yards if it was compacted 80%? So you'd take 27 divided by 80. That would give you a factor of 3.375. Multiply it times 100%. Your original volume was 33.75 yards. The logic is that 27 cubic yards equals 80% of some number. So you divide 27 by 80 and that gives you a factor. You multiply by the 100% or the original volume and you have the original volume of, of uh, soil before it's compacted. You can also cross multiply if that makes more sense to you. You can use cross multiplication. Angles of repose. In order to stabilize a trench in sand, gravel, or wet clay, it's necessary to slope the sides in what's called an angle of repose. The more cohesive the soil, the steeper the angle of repose can be. And then we have a list here of your typical angles of repose. 45 degrees or one to one is very common, and 33 degrees or one and a half to one are very common in use and on the exam. And what that tells you is one to one means for every one foot you go down, you go out one foot. One and a half to one means for every foot you go down, you go out one and a half feet. So your slope gets larger. Volume calculations. Excavation is a volume calculation. Excavation is calculated length times width times height. And that gives you cubic feet divided by 27 gives you cubic yards. This holds true for excavations where only two sides of the trench or hole are being excavated. If all four sides must have an angle of repose, then you use the volume calculations for a trapezoid rather than a rectangle. The easy way to calculate an excavation with four sides having an angle of repose is to turn them into rectangles and add one corner. Here's the formula for a trapezoid. It's the area equals length one plus length two divided by two. So the area of the top plus the area of the bottom added together and then divide by two or you can take the center line or the middle height of your trapezoid and uh, determine the volume. There's also the missing, you also add back a missing corner. So the total formula for calculating all four sides of an excavation is cubic yards equals two times length one plus length two divided by two plus your second, plus two times your width. That's out of walkers. If that makes sense to you, you can use that. Otherwise, we have a, a, an easy solution. You make this trapezoid into a rectangle by moving one side of the triangle to the other side. It, it, you make it back into a square, okay, or a rectangle, actually. Now we have a rectangle again. So let's solve the problem for a rectangle rather than a trapezoid. So now instead of having 100 feet wide by 100 feet long and 6 feet deep with an angle of repose of 1.5 to 1, we would add the extra area or 9 feet to each of the sides of the rectangle, which, is this, which, which gives us in effect the center line calculation. It's 109 feet times 109 feet 
times 6 feet gives us 71,286 feet. So we've taken that trapezoid and we've made it back into a rectangle by moving 9 feet to one side. Now we have the, the lost corner. The formula for the lost corner is base times base times height divided by 3. And in this case, that's 9 times 9 times 6 divided by 3 is 162 square feet. So the total area you're going to have is 71,448 feet divided by 27 to, con to convert to cubic yards. It's going to give you 2,646 cubic yards is a pretty good estimate of how much dirt you're going to have to pull out of this excavation. And that's the easy way to do it. That's, that's the quick, easy way you should be able to do all these excavation problems in two or three minutes each. Caissons. Caissons can be dug as straight shafts or bell-shaped at the bottom to increase load area. The caisson carries through the unsatisfactory soil down to the material that can hold the load. Shoring is used when there's insufficient room to stabilize the slope. Shoring can be in the form of wood, steel, or concrete sheet piling. Shoring is used when there is insufficient room to stabilize the slope. Shoring can be in the form of wood, steel, or concrete sheet piling. In cases where the soil can support a structure, it's often necessary to install a caisson. Sheet pile shoring calculations. Calculating the amounts of product needed and the material to be used. Determine the perimeter or girth of the excavation. This will provide the number of lineal feet required. This is out of chapter two of Walker's. Add up all four sides to obtain lineal feet. First, let's consider metal sheet pilings that come in pre-cut lengths. If you're using metal sheet pilings, determine the product that you're going to be using, such as MZ38. From the table in Chapter 2 of Walker's, we see that MZ38 is 18 inches wide and comes in various lengths. If we divide the girth of the excavation by 1.5 feet, or 18 inches, this will tell us how many pieces of metal sheet piling we will need to buy. Now determine the length of the sheet metal that will be required. Usually one foot above grade on top and one to two feet will be driven into the ground. Take this amount and multiply by the total number of pieces required to shore the excavation. If the question asks for it, determine the weight of the sheet metal piling. The easiest way to do this is by multiplying the square feet of the material used times the square foot weight from table in Walker's chapter two. Sheet pile shore calculations. Here's an example. Basement is 100 feet by 57 feet and eight feet deep. With one foot above grade and one foot driven into the ground, we use MZ38 piling. So 100 plus 100 plus 57 plus 57 gives us our girth, our 314 square feet. We divide that by 1.5 feet, or 8 inches, and we come up with 209 sheets of MZ38 sheet piling. And these 210 pieces need to be 10 feet long. So we need 2,100 square feet. That's 38 pounds per square foot. So we need to buy 79,800 pounds of sheet pile, of steel sheet piling. Board feet calculations. If you're using wood, then you have to change the dimensions from linear feet into board feet. A board foot is a measure of quantity based on nominal dimensions equal to 144 square inches which equates to a board that is one foot square and one inch thick. Lumber is commonly referred to as nominal size, which at one time was the same as the rough sawn measurement. The nominal width means you use the dimension for rough sawn labor, lumber. The nominal width means you use the dimension for rough sawn lumber, such as two by four or two by six, even if you're if you're using dressed lumber. Dressed lumber is lumber which has been surfaced or planed uh, to obtain smoothness of surface and uniformity of size. If it's planed on one side, it's called S1S, planed on two sides, S1E, and uh, planed on two sides, it's S2S, and if you do all four sides, it's S4S, which stands for surface four sides. 
Okay, dressing or planing the lumber shaves a quarter inch off the dimensions. On thinner pieces of lumber, only an eighth inch is shaved off each dimension. Board feet measurement, or BFM. In most applications of board foot measurement, you use nominal dimensions. In calculating board feet for shoring and forming, you use actual width of the board when determining the number of boards that will be required. If you're using rough sawn lumber, then use the nominal width when calculating the number of pilings necessary. If you're using S4S or shaved lumber, then you use the actual width to calculate the number of piling planks required. It's most common to use tongue and groove planks as they're easier to keep straight and they hold out water. Tongue and groove lumber is the most common to use as they are easier to keep straight and they hold water out. The top corners of the planks are cut off to minimize splitting when they are being driven into the ground. The bottom edge of each plank is angle cut to facilitate ground penetration. Using the table lumber required for sheet piling in Walker's Chapter 2. Calculating BFM using walkers. According to the table in Walker's Chapter 2, 100 square feet of area equals 220 board feet of 2 by 8 tongue and groove. Therefore, 314 foot girth of the excavation times 10 foot deep is 3,140 square feet divided by 100 square feet. So you're, you're getting your unit of measure again. It's 31.4 times 220 board feet means that you need 6,908 board feet. Or you can say 220 board feet divided by 100 equals 2.2. Therefore, 3,140 square feet times 2.2, again, gives you 6,908 board feet. Using the board foot formula, board feet equals thickness times width times length divided by 12 times the number of planks. One piling 2 by 8 by 10 feet divided by 12 inches gives you 13.33 board feet per plank, 314 feet excavation uh, diameter of your excavation times 12 inches gives you 3,768 inches and you divide that by 7.25 the actual width of, an, of the 8 inch board. The nominal width is 8 inches but the actual width after it's shaved is 7.25 inches. So you divide 3,768 inches by 7.25 inches and you come up with you need 520 boards, tongue and groove. So 520 times 13.33 board feet means you need to order 6,931 total board feet of lumber. So there are a number of different ways you can solve every one of these problems. You just have to find the, the way of solving the problem that's easiest for you. Yet another board foot method, you can say 7.25 inch actual width of the board times 12 inches equals 0.604, 314 feet girth of the excavation divided by 0.604 gives you 520 boards, okay? Times 13.33 board feet per plank again gives you 6,929 total board feet required. So you understand that in using the formula, you use nominal thickness and width times your length divided by 12 but you use girth or perimeter of the excavation divided by the actual width of the planks. Sheep's foot roller problem, we're on a new problem now. We solved the sheep's foot roller problems by using the table in chapter two of walkers. And that table is the rate of the sheep's foot roller compaction in cubic yards. The assumptions that this table makes are that the number of passes of the roller will be between one pass and 12 passes, that the materials can be compacted to 70, 80, or 90 percent, that the sheep's foot roller is five feet wide, that the roller operates at 2.5 miles an hour, that the fill is brought in in 12 inch layers, that the job efficiency rate is 100 percent, and that there's no loss of time for maneuvering. So this is sort of a perfect world calculation. The width of the sheep's foot roller on the exam questions can be 5 feet, 10 feet, or 15 feet. So you've got to read that carefully and if, if they give you a, a 10 or 15 foot wide sheep's foot roller, then you have to multiply the chart answer by 2 or 3. 
The compaction rate of the fill is given in 70, 80, or 90 percent. If the fill is being laid in less than 12 inch depth layers, you must adjust the cubic yards that are being compressed. The table in walkers gives, gives it to you in 12 inch layers, but if you're only bringing in 6 inch layers, then you have to either divide by 2 or multiply by 0 0.50, one half. Okay, because you're bringing it in in 6 inch layers instead of 12 inch layers, so you're using half the chart amount. Now if they bring it in in 9 inch layers, again you multiply it by 0.75, so you're using 3 quarters as much as the chart amount. Job efficiency rate, the table assumes none. A typical rate varies between 90% and 83%. This becomes a factor by which you modify the table answer and what your job efficiency is like for maybe turning around or lost time for refueling the machine, anything like that. And they will assume that a person works anywhere from a 50 minute hour to a 45 minute hour on a machine and the rest of the time they, they is lost for some reason, either refueling or turning. But in the chart, they don't have a deduction for job efficiency. But in the problems, they may have one. Maneuvering or turning also counts as time. Uh, it's another factor that you must deduct from the table answer. The job loss rate can vary from 5 to 10%. Therefore, you'd multiply.